Okay, so the Tomcat container. This is where it fits in the architecture, right? The three kind of main pieces for running DHIS2 is your database, which we looked at last week, and your DHIS2 instance, if you like. And that's basically what's running inside a, a Tomcat container. And then there's the, the reverse proxy, which is running at the front of all of that. Um, we're not really going to look at the reverse proxy till tomorrow. So the Tomcat container is probably um, the most complicated, I guess, of all the the three main instant the three main containers, um, and it's also arguably the the one that needs to be treated the most carefully. Um, we'll talk a little bit of that as we go on. Just in terms of principle. Um, if you have a DHIS2 instance running in, in this environment, then we create a new container for it and we load a Tomcat into that container and the instance runs on its own in there with no other things running, just the Tomcat. Um, in the past, I know with a previous, previous incarnation of DHIS tools, we had a number of DHS2 instances running in the same kind of memory and CPU slice. We're not doing that anymore. If you want a new instance, make a new Tomcat, it runs on its own in there. That keeps it simple in a way. Each Tomcat is set up exactly the same as the other one. A little bit of protection for the containers. They all run um, with a firewall inside the container, which basically just allows a connection from the proxy server. Uh, one addition, it also allows connection from the from the monitor. As a convention, it doesn't have to be like this, but this is the way we've done it. Um, it's maybe a little bit inflexible, but it's it's kind of clean and clear. When you make a container a DHS two instance, let's say we made one called HMIS, then you'll have a database called HMIS. It'll be accessed with the database user called HMIS. And then you'll access the, the sort of web front end to it um, with a context of HMIS. So once you've picked a name for your, for your um, DHS2 instance, we use the same name throughout those four different places. I guess that does actually imply there's some restrictions on what characters and things you can use in a name. Um, I've not really been too careful with that. You just need to, don't get too exotic. Um, by default, um, we're running version nine of Tomcat. It has a few interesting quirks to it, but it seems to work very well by and large. It's running on OpenJDK version eight, and this is a this is something that will change at some point because JDK eight is now pretty old. Um, the default JDK I think you get with Ubuntu twenty zero four is probably eleven. Can't remember. I think it's version eleven. Um, we understand that later the latest versions of DHS2 will run on 11, um, but I need to get it in black and white from the devs first before we before we move from version 8. Um, it's going to be a little bit tricky to move because if I make version 11 the default, then it will depend on which war which version of DHS2 war file you've installed as to whether it'll work or not. The package, um, I'm going to show you this in a bit more detail later anyway, but the the package that we're using to run it, the, the actual runtime is the JRE runtime. Um, Morton was asking me earlier this morning why we don't use the JDK rather than the just the JRE. I guess the JRE is smaller, it's more minimal runtime. There may be, in fact, there are a couple of good reasons to install the full JDK, um, particularly for debugging purposes. Perhaps we'll revise that. The Tomcat 9 itself is running under 
um, system D. Uh, that's basically the mechanism for starting and stop. The operating system uses for starting and stopping and running the container or running the the Tomcat executable. Um, that has a couple of implications for things like file permissions and logging, which we'll look at going forwards. DHS2 home directory. Um, if any of you have set up DHS2 in the kind of more manual way, one of the things you'll know that you needed to set is your environment variable for DHS2 home. If you're looking for where it is with this setup, um, it defaults to opt DHS2. So that's where you find your DHS comp file and things like that. Again, we'll, we'll have a look at the files. Um, in fact, we don't have to set the environment variable at all because this is this is actually the default. If you don't set DHS2 home, then it's assumed to be in opt DHS2. Right, so... Perhaps before we go on to customize, let's make a container. Um, just so that we are all we'll move this out of the way. Um, click on here. Right, so the way you create a container is a DHS to create an instance and call it Bob. Now, before I do that, let me just have a look at my IP addresses. Yeah, I've got DHIS to create an instance, we'll call it Bob, and we'll put it on an IP address, 192.168.0. I can see the next one free is 13. And we'll tell it to use the Postgres container for its database. If you just go DHS to create instance Bob, it will try and guess a reasonable IP address and default the database container for you. But I prefer to be explicit. Okay, this takes about a minute or two to create. Uh, we went through this process before. I, sh uh, I probably should have sued it. You can see it's created the database. In fact, it created a user, a database user called Bob, created a database called Bob. Um, it's now creating a container called Bob. I hope it's gone a bit quiet. And it's going to install some stuff into that container. Um, Basically, it will install Tomcat 9 and maybe two or three other packages, not, but not very much at all. And then it does a few little tweaks, which I'll show you. There's the open JDK 8 JRE. Okay, that should be done. And usually what we do now, we could run anything in there, but we use it for running a JD, uh, uh, DHS2 war file. Let's pop a war file in there so we can... Um, and I talk a bit about how you pop a war file in there. At the moment, I'm just gonna do it. Afterwards, I'll explain why I do it like this. Copy the link address of 235, which we're all waiting for the next release. And I can PHIS to my raw file from a link. What's the link? That's the link. Deploy it where? Deploy it into Bob. <laughs> okay, so what we do, we're downloading the raw file. It actually is going to unzip it and check it to make sure that the download wasn't corrupted. Sometimes we've seen people have errors by deploying corrupt war files. Um, 
It's not very common, but it does happen from time to time. Okay, so as I was saying, when we created this thing, let's go and have a look at the database quickly. You know, you know where your database container is now. Um, it should have created a database called Bob. There it is, and owned by a user called Bob. Um, that's and the other thing it should have done is it should have created on the reverse proxy. We'll talk more about the reverse proxy tomorrow. But quick look in there. It should have created a file. in a folder called upstream with the name of the container as well. Uh, we're basically just saying if somebody comes to my proxy with slash Bob, it's gonna push it through to my Tomcat at the back there. So all of that, those are the three things that happen when you do DHIS to create instance. Okay, let's get the slides. Right, so summarizing, after you've installed an instance like that and you've deployed Tomcat onto it, there's a few things that you're typically going to want to have to want to make some little tweaks on. Um, Java opts, right? That's the sort of parameters for your JVM. The place, the place where you should adjust those or fiddle with them is in etc default tomcat 9 that's the directory that ubuntu gives us by default when it installs tomcat probably the most important thing you need to do set in there is your heap size um, and that kind of depends quite a lot on the on the number of users that you're expecting the kind of instance that you're running often you may have to have a go pick a heap size and then adjust it a bit as you go along. Um, there are a few other suggestions in that file, which I'll show you in a second, which you could also tweak. Um, I'll try to make a few helpful comments. Let's have a quick look in that file then. Um, keep going to move this thing out of the way. Alexi exec Bob. Bash, let's go into the container. And uh, in there, we can see um, here, this is commented out, right? Your, your heap settings. Um, if you don't set anything, if you leave it like this, and this is what you'll get by default, um, then your JVM has to has to design. The algorithm for doing this has changed a little bit over the years, but I understand what we do currently is going to look at however much RAM that there is available on the system, and it's going to pick a quarter of that. Um, which is fine if you're running one instance. Um, if you're running six or seven instances, then um, you obviously can't give each one a quarter of the RAM. You have to tone it down a bit. So in production, certainly it's better to set this thing explicitly. <coughs> you need to make a few calculations. In my case, I think this machine, I can't remember offhand, I think this machine has 16 gigabytes of RAM, of which I gave eight gigabytes to Tomcat. I mean, to Postgres, uh, probably a, a sensible heap to run with would be something like four gig. That'll be a bit low for a production instance. Um, it's a good idea in with the server to set the the maximum heap, heap size, that's the first setting, set the minimum heap size the same as the maximum. The reason for that really is that it gives the garbage collector a little bit of an easier job. As a garbage collector typically does two things, right? It cleans, it basically cleans up the memory. 
if your Java application has created objects on the heap, then every now and again, the garbage collector scans the heap and gets rid of them. Um, what it will also do is um, after deallocating the, those objects off the heap, it will try to try to reduce the size of the heap down towards what you specified as the minimum heap size. So that's a second operation that it's doing. First of all, it's scanning and deallocating objects, and then secondly, it's trying to shrink the heap down. If you set the minimum size the same as the maximum size, then it's not going to bother trying to shrink the heap. So that makes the Java collection a little bit simpler to do, a little bit faster, um, at the cost of which you basically have that memory reserved. There's a couple of other settings I've put in here. Um, this one apparently is important. You can go read that Stack Overflow post yourself. Um, a lot of the Java cryptography functions depend on a source of randomness from somewhere. Um, traditionally, that would come from a Unix pseudo device called DevRandom. Um, the problem with randomness is that it's, it's actually a limited resource. I mean, dev, the, the sources of randomness um, that you get out of DevRandom, that comes from things like the CPU clock and if it's on a laptop you're picking up your mouse movements and things like that uses all those things to create randomness um, if you have a lot of containers running you can actually run out of random numbers in that file and you have to wait for more randomness uh, and that's particularly a problem with virtual machines and with containers because they don't have the hardware those hardware randomness sources, right? The jitter on the network interface and things like that. So it has happened. I've seen it on occasion. Your Tomcat can simply just stop, right? It won't go anywhere because um, it's blocked trying to read random numbers out of dev random. So setting that source of randomness to dev you random rather than random basically just ensures that that operation will never block um, it's quite an important thing to do as i say on on virtual machines it's not necessary typically on, on physical hardware uh the garbage collector you probably shouldn't go fiddling down here unless you know what you're doing um the most kind of modern garbage collector i suppose the one with supposedly all the best features is something called G1. Um, and that's what this line does. It specifies to use G1, you, G1 GC, and that's a G1 garbage collector. If you were using Java version 11 or Java 9, then G1 would be there as a default. Because we're using, using Java 8, we have to actually tell it to use G1. Um, there's some circumstances where the older parallel GC might actually perform better than G1. I've certainly seen those cases. Um, a lot of times, I mean, there have been a few buggy parts of DHS2 where we're allocating much too much heap memory. Um, so the garbage collector is very, very busy. Um, and sometimes with G1, the process of cleaning up that garbage uses much more CPU than the older garbage collector. So there's a possibility to change your garbage collector algorithm. You just comment this one out and uncomment that one. Um, but in most cases, I would suggest you just leave that alone. Um, there's another couple of options to fiddle around with your garbage collector here. Um, this is really a couple of settings which which um, you're basically telling your, your JVM that it's allowed to stop everything for one and a half seconds while it cleans up garbage. Um, that's, again, uh, a useful setting if, you, if your um, Tomcat is doing quite a lot of garbage collection. Then I would probably just leave that the way it is. 
um, is going to work for you in most cases. The very last line has got to do with if you're installing a profile on like like glow root, um, we need to specify on the command line the agent. We're actually going to do that later this morning. So yeah, the main thing in this file after you've installed is you probably want to go and set your heap size. What you set it to depends on, on how many containers you have, how much memory you have available, how much you've already allocated to Postgres. You've got to do those calculations to see what you've, what you've got left. Um, I used to run Tomcat with very, very large heaps. Um, there are some cases with very busy servers handling many, many parallel connections. You might need very big heaps. Typically, you wouldn't have heaps much over 32 gig, though I think we do have a couple running with 48 gig. <laughs> um, don't put the heap bigger than it needs to be, right? Start with a reasonable sized heap, and if you find you have problems, then you might have to increase that. Um, Okay, so tweaks. I have mentioned after you've installed, you probably want to go in there and set your whoops, set your heap size. Um, other files, Tomcat line server.xml is one worth looking at. The main thing you might think of looking at in there is the size of the, the thread pool. Um, let's have a quick look in that file. VI, you don't have to use VI. You can use nano. I just like VI. Okay, this file is a little bit customized. It's actually quite a lot customized from the default server.xml that you get. A few things in here worth noting, I guess. Um, server port equals minus one about Tomcat's control port. Uh, we've enabled Tomcat users. This is this is basically for the for the Tomcat the Tomcat um, manager application. The username and password on that. This one here, the Tomcat thread pool, you can see is set maximum number of threads of 100 and minimum number of threads of 10. Um, you can adjust that in both directions. If you've got a small instance, but often people will create a staging instance or a, or a test instance. Um, now that doesn't need to have 100 threads. It may work quite happily with 10 threads, right? So you could reduce the size of the thread pool. That'll save a few resources. Um, if you're having to deal with a lot of concurrency and you're finding some bottleneck, uh, it's possible to increase the number of threads from here. Um, typically, you've got two places where you can you can unthrottle your concurrency. I guess one is on the the database connection pool, and the other is this Tomcat thread pool. There may be some instances where if you find all your Tomcat threads are busy and connections are are, are not being made. Increasing the maximum threads can help. You've got to be careful because it could also make it worse. Um, if you're using all your CPU already and you or all your memory and you're just adding more threads, um, sometimes you're not attacking. You're not um, attacking the source of the problem. Either way, that's this is what you get the default: a thread pool of a hundred. Uh, a thread pool of 100 may not suit every particular environment. Um, there's nothing else in here generally you'd need to change, uh, except that's this one. I've commented out the Tomcat access log. Um, basically, because you're going to get access logging on your proxy, right? whether it's Apache 2 or whether it's Nginx. You don't also have to log those same accesses on Tomcat. Um, sometimes you want to if you're debugging, right? If you find for some reason you can't access your, your Tomcat and you want to see that the connections are actually being made, 
uh, it can be a good idea to just uncomment these lines here. Let me get rid of this comment. Down to this comment. That'll enable access logging on the Tomcat itself. Um, typically, I would only do that if I'm trying to discover a problem, right? And having having satisfied myself that the requests are actually getting through to Tomcat, I turn off the logging again there. Don't need to log all those requests twice. Uh, this is a interesting recent addition. It's just a bit of security, really. Now, by default, when you get an error page on Tomcat, it shows you quite a bit of information about, about the Tomcat server, which is typically not necessary. That's probably easier if I show you the effect of that. Um, so here's my instance here. If I were to go to HMIS, I try to get to an error page. Uh, no, that's not going to give me an error. Let's go to a URL. Oh, it doesn't exist. Oh, well, I'm getting a not found. That's not giving me an error either. I'm struggling to get an error. Ah, okay. We've got an instance here called test two. And, um, it's giving me a 404 not found. Notice this page is not telling me that it's getting served up by Tomcat 9. Um, it's not telling me that it's running on Ubuntu. It's simply telling me that I've got a 404. Um, that, is, that is because we um, have got those couple of lines in server.xml, which tells it not to produce those particular bits of information. All right. Um, okay. And I've mentioned before that the dhis.conf is in opt dhis2. Uh, what I've done with that file is I've taken the configuration reference from here and I've put it in there just as a sort of starter rather than you just having a blank file to start with. Um, you should always still go and read the documentation here partly because um, the file, my, the reference file that you have in there may be out of date with new versions of DHIS. Um, it's always better to read the reference, but I thought it's still helpful that you have it there. Um, let's go to it. show you what I mean. So instead of giving you a blank file here, you've got a bit of a starter file. Um, the database connection stuff is all done automatically for you. You don't need to worry about that. That happens when the instance was created. Um, so it's created you the database Bob, the user Bob, a funny password. Password's not really important. You don't ever really need to use this password. Only Tomcat needs to know it. Um, okay, a few things that you can tweak in this file. The connection pool, this is the number of connections that DHS2 makes to Postgres. Um, Morton, a note, a note we need to make this default is actually incorrect. Default is actually 80. If you don't set the size of the, of the connection pool, you actually will get a connection pool size of 80. Um, 80 is pretty random, doesn't necessarily going to fit all situations. Again, if you've got a small test instance, you can make the connection pool size down to 10. If you've got a very busy instance with a lot of concurrency, you might find that connection pool size is too small. You might want to increase it above 100. You've got to be careful if you keep increasing the size of the connection pool and you have a number of different instances, each one have their own connection pool. On the Postgres server itself, you might need to, at some stage, increase the number of maximum connections. Okay, a couple of other settings in here that are 
worth noting. Um, um, Yeah, this is an important setting, really. I should actually uncomment it by default. This is server-side cache for your analytics. Um, if you don't have this set, then every time you make an analytics query, it makes a backend SQL query to the database. If you set a cache on here, then um, some of those queries to the backend database get cached. And so, Release, release releases quite a bit of load on the server. Uh, there's a few other things in here I typically change. Uh, this is another important thing. I think particularly with tracker-based systems, systems where you're dealing with individual data, this is a session timeout, right? That's the time where if you log into DHIS2, then you go off and have your lunch and come back and start working again. You'll find whether you've been logged out or not. All right, the time the time that you you remain logged in until you actually touch something, click on something new, or whatever it might be. Default session timeout on DHIS two I think is actually ridiculously high, thirty six hundred seconds. That's an that's an hour. All right, sixty seconds times sixty minutes. An hour is kind of long for a session timeout. I think particularly for a, um, a system with kind of fairly sensitive data, 10 minutes is probably much more reasonable. Um, definitely an hour is too much, I think. Set up to 10 minutes. That means if you don't if you don't touch your computer for ten minutes, then um, you'll find your session will get timed out. You'll have to log in again. Okay, so those are a few of the tweaks that you might want to do inside um, dhis.conf. There are. Numerous other options in there. And I think there, there are even some options which are not properly documented um, on the reference page that we need to update. Um, but those are probably the main ones that you'd need to set on most systems. Okay, a little bit of word about security. Oh, I think we can pause. Yeah. Um, your Tomcat container, I've made the point here that it's perhaps the, the weakest link in your in your whole setup, right? With your operating system, your web reverse proxy, your database, all of those things, their default security settings are probably quite good. Um, inside your Tomcat, you're running this sprawling, massive DHS2 application. Right, I forget what the current size is. It's like 270 megabytes zipped or something. Very large application. Um, some of the code in it is very old, going back 10 years or more. Um, it's including many, many libraries by default. So at any moment in time, you might find that a vulnerability gets introduced into the web application. I mean, we work really hard to try to reduce the chance of that happening, but it can happen, and it has happened before, um, as as a result of using a library which which um, a vulnerability was discovered on. It wasn't actually the fault of DHIS two coders, but it meant that Tomcat containers running DHIS two and other things around the world all got exposed to this struts exploit. The problem is that when you're, if a vulnerability is exploited in your Tomcat container, what is typically going to happen is that your container becomes exposed to um, the user that's running Tomcat, exposing one of two ways. Um, either that user is able to read or write files onto the system, um, or worse, that user is able to execute um, programs on the system. Um, and one of the worst case scenarios is if you're running your Tomcat as the root user, 
and that was actually quite commonly done. I still find it from time to time, people running the Tomcat as root. The problem with running the Tomcat as root is that if there is a vulnerability, it means that effectively the root user has got access to your container. Um, if that happens, your only option really is to delete the container and start again. Um, but anyway, what we've tried to do, I guess, is to try to reduce the damage, the potential damage, so that if a vulnerability is exploited and this Tomcat user does effectively get access to your container, the best we can do at this point is to is to limit what that user can do. So that user is limited quite quite a bit. I mean, one thing, the Tomcat itself is running inside a container. So that means that um, access to anything is restricted to whatever can be accessed inside the container. So it can't access other containers, things like that. Um, there are only certain files and directories which it's able to see. Um, and um, the web apps directory itself, it's not able to modify the, the web application, it's only able to run it. Um, that's because the way that it's, it's deployed, we don't just throw a war file into the web apps directory and allow Tomcat to unzip it. Um, basically, we unzip the the war file, make it owned by root. So even if you have a rogue Tomcat, it's not going to be able to um, modify the application that's running. I spent quite a bit of time looking at CIS security benchmark. You can go, you can Google that CIS security benchmarks. Um, I've gone through the benchmark for Tomcat. We don't implement all of it, we implement quite a lot of it. Um, a few other things I've spoken to already was, yeah, we've allowed, allowed firewall connections only from the proxy. Um, I've done you a little bit of a tour already, I think, through, through the config files for Tomcat. I don't think we need to run through that, that again. I think what I do is pause at this point from here.